All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, today, what we're going to do, we are recording. Um, today, what we're going to do is continue on with mechanics of breathing, and then we're going to go through some of the gas laws. So ask questions um, after today. I hope that you have enough information that you can really get down the road on your essential respiratory calculation sheet. We're going to be talking about partial pressure today. Um, we're going to be talking about lung volumes, so that should help you get down the road on that worksheet. Um, Megna was here earlier. She actually put some of your essential renal calculation sheets in the back if you want to pick that up today as you're leaving. You can go ahead and do that. I don't think it's in alphabetical order, um, but, but uh, you can pick that up on your way out today. All right, so let's get going. We have a couple more lectures for respiratory, then we're going to be talking about on Friday. Um, I actually do have uh, a lot of um, things that I need to actually send you an announcement today. I need to tell you when the review session is going to be this Friday. So remember that's going to be between 3 and 5 on Friday. If you can make it, I will record it. Um, also, I need to post a couple of answer keys for you. So I apologize for that. I will post the severe dehydration answer key and uh, the, the renal essential calculation sheet as well. All right, so let's get going. We've already talked about uh, mammals being um, negative pressure breathers, okay? So um, we talked about the process of inhalation and exhalation. Remember that our respiratory neurons actually innervate these external intercostal muscles. You can see that they attach to your ribs, which uh, pulls the rib cage out and the diaphragm down, increasing the volume in the thoracic cage and ultimately the lungs. And when you increase volume, Boyle's Law states that you're going to decrease pressure. So air is always going to flow from high pressure to low pressure. That's Ohm's Law. You've, you've heard that a thousand times. I told you you'd hear Ohm's Law until ad nauseum, until you really didn't want to hear it anymore. But we're still going to continue in the respiratory section. So air is always going to flow from high pressure to low pressure. It pulls air in with inhalation. That's why we're negative pressure breathers. And then um, with exhalation, what happens is that innervation stops, the muscles relax, relax, the ribs and the diaphragm return back to their original position, and the volume decreases in the thoracic cage, and the air is pushed out, both by the decrease in volume, but also remember there's elastic recoil of the lungs, okay? The lungs are like a balloon. When you blow them up, they have an elastic property that actually helps to push air out. So here's where we left off. We were actually talking about these different transmural pressures. And for the exam, I do want you to know the definitions of these three different types of pressure. The definitions are actually on the right-hand side here. Here's an explanation. Uh, explanation of each of the definitions. And the first one is the transpulmonary pressure. It's actually the pressure difference across the visceral pleura, right? So it's the pressure in the alveoli minus the pressure in the intrapleural space. And we talked about why that has a negative pressure. I talked about those microscope slides that can slide up and down, but when you actually try to pull them apart, it creates almost a vacuum, a sub-atmospheric pressure in between those two pleural membranes. Okay, So the interpleural pressure is actually minus 4. When you subtract those together, uh, 0 minus minus 4 is 4 millimeters of mercury. And it's this pressure right here this arrow, you can see transpulmonary pressure, is opposing the elastic recoil of the lung. See that? It's actually opposing the elastic recoil of the lung. So the transpulmonary pressure, by definition, is the pressure difference holding the lungs open 
And again, it opposes the inward elastic recoil of the lung. Okay, transpulmonary pressure. Then this is where we left off on Friday. I had like 30 seconds to talk about chest wall pressure. Okay, so chest wall pressure is actually the pressure difference that's holding the chest wall in. And it opposes the elastic recoil of the chest wall. So it is, you can see here, chest wall pressure is equal to intrapleural pressure minus four minus atmospheric pressure, which is zero. Now remember, atmospheric pressure is not zero. It's 760 <coughs> millimeters of mercury. Okay, but they have actually normalized it to the atmospheric pressure. So you're not writing 760 millimeters of mercury and the alveolar pressure is 759 with inhalation. Okay, so chest wall pressure is equal to intrapleural pressure minus the atmospheric pressure. That happens to be minus four millimeters of mercury. And again, it's opposing the uh, chest wall. So let me just explain that for a minute. Have you ever looked at a model of a skeleton and when you look at it, you're like, oh my gosh, the ribs look so like bowed out, right? They're, they seem wider than normal. And that's because the chest wall, those ribs actually tend to bow out. So if you don't have any muscles or anything, lungs to keep them in, they will naturally bow out, all right? So the chest wall pressure and that intrapleural pressure is actually holding the chest wall in, okay? And it is opposing that outward elastic recoil of the chest wall. All right, the last one is the respiratory system pressure. And it is the pressure difference across the entire respiratory system. It's the alveolar pressure minus the atmospheric pressure. And at rest, when you're not breathing, they're basically the same. Atmospheric pressure is zero and alveolar pressure is zero. With inhalation, remember the alveolar pressure becomes negative, pulling air in. With exhalation, this alveolar pressure becomes one, positive, and that pushes air out, okay? So basically that respiratory system pressure is determining airflow. It's the pressure difference across the entire respiratory system, and notice it's usually this, uh, it's the driving force for airflow. All right, now here's a diagram that I don't want you to memorize. Way too many numbers. Uh, this is kind of a cryptic graph on the left-hand side, but I'll go through it with you. If you start here at number one, the end of expiration, you can actually see the atmospheric pressure and alveolar pressure are zero, so there's no airflow. And the intrapleural pressure is minus four. So the transpulmonary pressure is actually four, just as we talked about in the previous slide. When you're inhaling, right, this is mid-inspiration, you can actually see, because of those opposing forces of the chest wall trying to bow out and the lung recoil effect, that intrapleural pressure actually becomes even more subatmospheric. okay? And you can actually see the transpulmonary pressure, in effect, increases to five. That opens up the lungs, and now that decreases the alveolar pressure, negative one. And what that does is it tends to pull air in, as we talked about before. That respiratory system pressure is determining airflow. At the end of inspiration, you can see the transpulmonary pressure is the most negative, the tr uh, I'm sorry, the intrapleural pressure is the most negative at negative seven. That translates to the highest transpulmonary pressure at seven. But the alveolar pressure, this is the end of inspiration, is now zero, so there's no airflow. Air's already flown, uh, flowed into the lungs. All right, then exhalation occurs, the volume decreases, alveolar pressure rises, you've got that that lung recoil effect, 
So now air again is going to flow from high pressure to low pressure and air is going to flow out. And then the end of expiration is the end of the respiratory cycle, right? So don't memorize these numbers. It's not about that. I really just want you to see how the transpulmonary pressure and the intrapleural pressure change as you breathe in and out. So what you have here is atmospheric pressure stays constant throughout this whole thing, right? Still at sea level, 760 millimeters of mercury. But it's the alveolar pressure that's actually changing. First it decreases with inhalation, air flows in. Then it increases with inhalation, air flows out. So this purple right, line is actually symbolizing what's happening in the purple area. Right? So that's easy to kind of coordinate. You can see the uh, intrapleural pressure decreases with inhalation and then it goes back up to normal. Now think about it this way, when you're trying to pull those microscope slides away from each other, it actually creates a bit of a vacuum in between. When the lungs actually, when the rib cage bows out, it pulls the lungs open and that's what you're seeing here this increase in intrapleural pressure and transpulmonary pressure. That's increasing the volume and allow allowing the pressure in the alveoli to drop and air to be pulled in. And then this is the volume within the lungs, right? This is air. Uh, this is volume. All right, so I've mentioned this before. I want to make sure that I formally give you this definition as well. Boyle's Law states that the pressure of a fixed number of gas molecules is inversely proportional to the volume. All right, and why does that happen? This is a nice visual. Again, we've already talked about Boyle's Law, but I want to make sure that everybody has some kind of physical intuition about it. When you compress the volume, when you decrease the volume, what's happening is these gas molecules, there's more collisions. Right? Those gas molecules are more confined in a finite space, more collisions occur, and the increase in pressure occurs. Opposite with the increase in volume on the right-hand side here. If you have decompression, the volume increases, there's less collisions that happen with those gas molecules and the pressure decreases. All right, so pretty easy, Boyle's Law. Let's revisit Ohm's Law. All right, so I like going through this. You already have some intuition about this. We've talked about Ohm's Law over and over and over again. In this case, instead of Q for cardiac output, when we talked about that with the heart, now we're talking about F. This is airflow. It's still a flow in mils per minute. All right, airflow. And remember, driving force equals flow times resistance. And I've just rearranged it now. So I've rearranged it so flow is equal to the driving force over resistance. Okay, And what is the driving force? I already mentioned this. The driving force is the respiratory system pressure. It's the pressure difference across the entire respiratory system. So it's the alveolar pressure minus the atmospheric pressure. That's the driving force for airflow over resistance. All I've done is I've rearranged Ohm's Law. Okay. So air enters the lungs when the alveolar pressure is less than the atmospheric pressure. And the opposite occurs when the alveolar pressure is greater than the atmospheric pressure. Then air exits the lungs. All right, so airflow, again, is a function of the pressure differences between the alveoli and the atmosphere divided by airflow resistance. So this is a figure from your textbook. Again, it's just saying the same thing. Flow is equal to the driving force, the pressure difference. Again, that's the respiratory system pressure difference over resistance. All right, so this should be pretty easy to understand now. Let's concentrate on resistance and define some of those terms with resistance in the airways, okay? You've seen this already before. This is Poisson's law, right? This is actually applies to the respiratory system as well. 
Remember the law of bulk flow. It's still the same with flow. Resistance of the respiratory system is equal to 8 times the length of the bronchial, the tube. N is viscosity divided by pi r to the fourth. R, small r here, is the radius of the tube. So instead of Q, we're going to use F. That's airflow. Right? The pressure gradient is the respiratory system pressure. And then resistance can be defined as 8L, the length of the tube. Multiply that by viscosity over pi r to the fourth. All right, same thing applies here. So you've already learned about this. Small changes in the radius of the bronchioles translates to huge changes in resistance. So when you have smooth muscle cells that are surrounding those bronchioles and they constrict and they decrease the radius because of the r to the fourth value, that actually translates to huge changes in resistance. So think about that with asthma. Small changes in the radius of those bronchioles really leads to huge changes in resistance and discomfort with people that have asthma. Okay? All right. So these flow charts are really just to help you with your studying again. It's really about inhalation, and this is a flow chart now kind of telling you what's happening with intrapleural pressure and transpulmonary pressure and air flowing into the alveoli, and then this is a flow chart with the opposite. What happens to intrapleural pressure, transpulmonary pressure, and then what happens with the volume pressure and that it leads to air flowing out of the lungs with expiration. Pretty good. All right, so uh, there is an animation that I will put online. Um, actually, it's already online. Um, you can, if you have any trouble accessing some of those videos, just let me know. I'll try to put them on YouTube. Um, but I found a couple of different apps that you can use to open these up with. They're um, SWF files. All right, so now, this is another diagram that you've already seen. I want to now re-explain this in a different way. We used this diagram before when we were describing surfactant and how surfactant changes compliance within the alveoli. Now I'm going to apply it to the lung as a whole. Think about the whole organ, that lung as a whole. Lung compliance is again the measure of the lungs stretchability. All right, and again, compliance is equal to the lung volume, the change in lung volume over the change in the transpulmonary pressure. Now you know what transpulmonary pressure is. All right, when the compliance is abnormally high, the lungs might fail to hold themselves open and are prone to collapse. When the compliance is abnormally low, the work of breathing is increased. All right, so let me give you some examples so that you can really understand what I'm saying here. The green line right here is normal compliance. Now, a patient that has cystic fibrosis, we've actually talked about cystic fibrosis before, they have a lot of scar tissue, okay? And with that scar tissue, it really takes a lot of work to inhale, all right? So you can see here, you have to go to huge changes in the transpulmonary pressure in order to just make small changes in lung volume, right? It takes a lot of work to breathe because of that fibrosis. That's why it's called cystic fibrosis. It's kind of like scar tissue that builds up and now it's very difficult to open up your lungs. The work of breathing is increased. All right, let's take the opposite, right? The opposite is this blue line. This is high compliance. You would think that would be advantageous. Oh, you don't need much transpulmonary pressure, 
to open up the lungs quite a bit, right? You can really open up the lungs with just very small changes in transpulmonary pressure. But this is very indicative of an excruciating disease call, called emphysema, okay? So you would, again, think it was advantageous. What's happening with emphysema is that you've lost the you've lost elastin. You've lost the elastic recoil of the lungs. So it's kind of like blowing air into a sandwich baggie, right? Really easy. You just blow a little bit of air and it expands. It expands a lot, okay? Um, but there's no elastic recoil. So the problem is actually forcing air out. Okay, so what happens with patients that have emphysema is they have to start using their abdominal muscles, their kind of uh, um, chest muscles, and they really have to work to get air out of their body. It's actually a pretty devastating disease. And again, my anti-smoking campaign, smoking leads to emphysema. Okay, so just know that. So now I hope you really have a, an appreciation of the difference in compliance and what compliance means. The blue line is indicative of emphysema and the orange line here is indicative of cystic fibrosis. All right, so let's keep going along these lines. I've already talked to you about chest wall pressure and transpulmonary pressure and what that means. Let's talk about another pathophysiological state. Let's talk about pneumothorax. I'm going to come back to that previous slide. Pneumothorax is actually a term that implies that there's some kind of puncture in the pleural sac. Now remember there's two pleural membranes. There's an outer one called the parietal pleura and there's an inner one called the visceral pleura. So let's go back to this. You can puncture the outer one called the parietal pleura and the inner one called the visceral pleura. And both of them lead to what's called pneumothorax. And everybody's heard of a collapsed lung, right? But why does that happen? Remember that the intrapleural pressure here is very negative. Right? It's usually minus 4 to minus 7 millimeters of mercury because of those two opposing forces. Right? The elastic recoil of the lung and the elastic recoil of the chest wall make this very negative inside. So one example, again, my, that same paramedic, my former student, who was telling me a story after class one day after we talked about pneumothorax, and this is a true story. He was working in Wisconsin, and uh, a couple were riding on a snowmobile, right? Have you actually ever seen telephone poles that have those rebar, the bars that go up and out? Uh, the driver of the snowmobile hit the telephone pole, and the, that bar went right into his lung, right? So what happened? They got him off that telephone pole, they got him down, and this is what's known. So what he did was he actually punctured the parietal membrane, that parietal pleura. And this is known as an open chest wound or an open sucking chest wound, all right? Because air is always gonna flow through the path of least resistance, right? So when this individual breathed in, the air was coming in through that sucking chest wound, right? All right, so what um, my paramedic friend said you can do, and I feel like MacGyver when I tell this story, if you actually have like a piece of plastic, even like something that holds bread, you know, and you actually put that piece of plastic on that open sucking chest wound, but you only tape it on three sides, what happens when he breathes in? <gasps> It, it actually collapses right on the wound and it prevents any air from flowing into that intrapleural space, all right? When he breathes out, it lets the air go out. What happens with a, uh, a collapsed lung is that air flows in to the intrapleural space, 
and it starts to accumulate, right? It starts to accumulate, accumulate, and then basically the lung actually gets to be the size of your fist, all right? So let's talk about, that's called an open chest wound. The other side is basically a, a breach of the visceral pleura, all right? Also leads to a pneumothorax. This would be a situation, number one, with emphysema. We already talked about emphysema. With emphysema, a lot of times because of the elastic recoil of the lung and that elastin degrading, air will actually seep from the lung into the intrapleural space. The other example that I always use is think about what happens with a car accident. The first thing you, that you would do right before you might hit something like a tree, you would go, <gasps> right? You would breathe in, and then if you hit something, you would basically, that blunt force would force air from your lung right into this intrapleural space. And then when you breathe in, you have a little bit of a breach. Air would just start to accumulate in that intrapleural space, causing a collapsed lung. If you've ever seen like Gray's Anatomy or back in my day, it was like ER, what you would do to relieve that is the paramedics would come upon the scene and they would actually stick a needle right through this um, uh, chest wall into the intrapleural space and immediately you would actually hear a hissing sound. And that would allow for all of the air to seep back out and the lungs would actually, they were collapsed, they would go right back to their original position. It's instant relief. All right. So that's how to think about a pneumothorax. Remember, it's all because of this negative intrapleural pressure. Okay. All right. This is actually an x-ray of what pneumothorax looks like. You can see the collapsed lung and all of the space in between. Usually the lung is connected to the rib cage. So when the rib cage pulls out, the lung actually pulls out too. So this is an example of a pneumothorax. All right, so let's keep going. I want to talk about lung volumes here. Uh, some people that are taking the lab have already heard this, but I do need to go through it with the class. Um, we're going to talk about four lung volumes, tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume, expiratory reserve volume, and residual volume. Uh, I think this is the picture in your textbook, but I'm going to go ahead and this is the exact same information, but I actually like this figure better to lecture from. So you need four lung volumes. You need to memorize that. You don't need to memorize the actual volumes. You just need to know what tidal volume is, inspiratory reserve volume, expiratory reserve volume. The lung capacities are the sum of at least two lung volumes, all right? And you will have to memorize this. This will help you with some of the questions on your respiratory sheet. All right, so let's start off with just um, tidal volume, all right? Tidal volume is the volume of air that you breathe in and breathe out with a normal breath, all right? Normally, you can see here, normally lung volumes and capacities for a healthy 70 kilogram, I think that's about 160 pounds, um, is about 500 mils. Okay. All right, so when you breathe in, that's about 500 mils, and when you breathe out, normally, that's about 500 mils. All right, that's called tidal volume. It's analogous to stroke volume in the heart. Okay. All right. Now, after a normal inhalation, so you're up here, everything that you can inhale maximally, all of the air that you can breathe in until you can't breathe any more air in, this is the end of a maximum inspiration, is called the inspiratory reserve volume, IRV, inspiratory reserve volume. And that's about 3,000 mils. All right. After a normal exhalation, so you're down here. This is after a normal exhalation. 
Everything that you can force out of your lungs maximally is the end of a maximum expiration is the expiratory reserve volume. It's about a thousand mils. All right, luckily for you, you actually still have some residual volume. This is the only volume that you cannot measure with a spirometer. Think about that. A spirometer only measures lung volumes that you can breathe in and out, right? It can only measure inspiratory reserve volume, tidal volume, or expiratory reserve volume. There's actually no way that you can exhale the residual volume. If I wanted to measure it, I could stick a vacuum cleaner down my throat, suck it all out. That would be excruciating for me and you to watch that. Okay? <laughs> all right, so I'm not going to do that. You can actually estimate what your uh, residual volume is by entering things like um, your weight, your height, things like that. Okay? All right. So that is residual volume. That's the last of the four lung volumes. It's usually about 1,200 mils. All right, so what are some of the lung capacities? The first one, inspiratory capacity, is just your tidal volume plus your inspiratory reserve volume. All right, tidal volume, 500 mils, plus your inspiratory reserve volume, about 3,000. That's about 3,500 mils. That's your inspiratory capacity. Your vital capacity is everything you can measure with a spirometer. It's everything but residual volume. It's the tidal volume plus the inspiratory reserve volume plus the expiratory reserve volume. Okay. So again, it's everything that you can measure with a spirometer. It's everything but residual volume. All right, functional residual capacity. This is a little less intuitive. FRC is equal to the expiratory reserve volume, what you breathe out after a normal exhalation, plus the residual volume. And then finally, total lung capacity. These are all four volumes added all together. So I would say this is the volume of air in your lungs after a maximal inspiration. It's the total lung capacity. It's all of the air in your lungs, the volume of air in your lungs after a maximal inhalation. All right. So remember that fresh air and uh, fresh air that's uh, taken into your lungs it mixes with stale air from that's left over from the preceding breath, and you have this anatomical dead space that you have to factor in. Anybody remember dead space? Remember, dead space is where there's no gas exchange. So you can have both anatomical dead space. That is basically the airways that are just responsible for bulk airflow. That's the trachea, the bronchi, and the terminal bronchioles. No gas exchange is occurring. That's only about bulk airflow. The only way that you can change your own anatomical dead space is if you put a snorkel in your mouth or somebody puts a tube in your, down your throat. All right, you do have to factor that in as anatomical dead space. Alveolar dead space is where there's parts of the lungs, some of the alveoli that are either not getting any air. This is a problem with COPD. If you have mucus plugs of the alveoli, alveolar ducts, and you're not getting air into those alveoli, then that's a problem. There's no gas exchange. So that's called alveolar dead space. Or if you have a capillary that is blocked, right? If you're not perfusing 
that alveoli because there's some clot, right? And you're not perfusing it. You're not getting blood to that alveoli. Again, there's no gas exchange. So that's called alveolar dead space. Yes? Is there any kind of dead space if it's completely blocked? Uh, it's only called dead space if there's just no gas exchange. Yep, yep. Um, all the time, you actually do have certain parts of your lungs that aren't, you know, for whatever reason, the alveoli are either plugged, maybe you have a cold, or your smoker, or, um, you know, any period of time, if you've been laying down for a long period of time, you not, may not have blood flow to certain parts of the lungs as well. Um, small parts, right? Uh, that's why, again, it's always great to wake up, breathe in deeply, right? Get those your body moving, you can actually decrease some of that alveolar dead space just by producing surfactant, right? Secreting surfactant. So, so now let's talk about the difference between minute ventilation and alveolar ventilation because this is actually very interesting. Minute ventilation is pretty much the same as cardiac output. So everything you know about cardiac output, just apply to minute ventilation. This is a flow in mils per minute, and it's equal to tidal volume in mils per breath, same as stroke volume, times respiratory rate instead of heart rate. So take a look at that. Tidal volume has units of mils per breath, respiratory rate is breaths per minute. Breaths actually cancel out and again minute ventilation is mils per minute. All right, but I do need to actually talk about alveolar ventilation because there's a real difference here. In this case what you're doing is you're taking the tidal volume and you're subtracting out the dead space volume. And all you're doing is calculating a flow in mils per minute, but you're taking out those areas, the volume of air that doesn't have any gas exchange. So why is this important? This is, I know this is very unassuming. If you were studying this, you could look at this chart and completely fly by it because it doesn't look that important. But it actually has a lot of information here. All right, so take a look at it. You have different patients, A, B, and C, right? And they all have exactly the same minute ventilation, mils per minute. But take a look at this. They actually have very different tidal volumes and respiratory rate, right? Frequency. The first one right here is only taking in enough air into the conducting zone and they're breathing very rapidly. So subject A I would say is almost panting, panting, right? And what they're doing is they basically aren't perfusing, they're not getting any air into their alveoli. So when you subtract off the dead space, alveolar ventilation is zero. This is what's known as hypoventilation, hypoventilation. Now, a lot of you probably have heard of hyperventilation. Maybe somebody, you know, in front of you has a scare and they start to have a panic attack, right? Their breathing rate goes up, right? However, they're not hyperventilating. They may be hypoventilating right, hypoventilating, because they're only bringing enough air into their conducting zone and there's no gas exchange. So alveolar ventilation is actually zero, right? That's why my paramedic friend said this too, you can't tell whether someone's hyper or hypoventilating just because their respiratory rate has increased. A lot of people said, here, here's a paper bag, right? They think that they're hyperventilating and they're blowing off too much CO2. So you give them a paper bag so that they can breathe in more CO2 to get back to normal. But they may be hypoventilating and then you're gonna make it worse. 
So my paramedic friend actually said, oh, they don't do that anymore. They don't give people a paper bag to breathe into. They just say, stop breathing that way. You're going to pass out, right? That's what they tell patients, right? Stop breathing that way. You're going to pass out. All right. So, um, okay. So B is a fairly normal, right? This is everyone normally breathes in about 12 breaths per minute. Normal tidal volume is about 500 mils per breath, okay? So in this case, alveolar ventilation, once you subtract off the dead space, remember this is how you do it, you just subtract off dead space volume from tidal volume. When you do that, alveolar ventilation is 4,200. That's normal. Now C is actually only breathing six breaths per minute, but every time they breathe, they bring in twice as much. When you subtract off the dead space, you only get about 900 mils per minute, and then you have an alveolar ventilation of 5,000. All right, this is technically hyperventilation. So you really have to look at the alveolar ventilation to see if someone is hypo or hyperventilating. So just to help out, because some students I know still kind of struggle with these terms, hypo means too little. Hyper means too much. Okay, yes, question. Um, when they're calculating the amount of time of dead space, why is it? Why, like, where does the 150 come from? Okay, so the 150 is actually the dead space. That's going to oh, be the anatomic dead space. Yeah, great question. So you have to subtract off. And they are only subtracting off the anatomic dead space. Technically, physiological dead space. I better write that down. Okay, so physiological... dead space is equal to anatomical dead space plus alveolar dead space. Now, I think this is actually number two in your essential calculation sheet. And I'm not going to give you specifics. I kind of want you to struggle with that one a little bit. What happens to alveolar dead space when you exercise? So think about that. And then you can actually calculate the physiological dead space. All right, so going back. Now that you know something about alveolar, dead, or alveolar ventilation, um, what I wanted to just show you here is that differences in alveolar ventilation are going to actually give you differences in, um, you can see here, what happens with O2 and what happens with CO2. So like I mentioned with the paper bag um, example, I want to just make sure that you see this graph to really help you with what happens with hypoventilation and hyperventilation. Now, the ultimate hypoventilation is holding your breath, right? So I always think about the extreme. The ultimate, I'm going to say that again, hypoventilation is holding your breath. So what's going to happen? O2 levels in your body are going to plummet. They're going to really fall. And CO2 is going to accumulate in your body. And that's a volatile acid. Okay? So that's what happens with hypoventilation. And then a lot of times people do pass out because of that accumulation of CO2 and lack of oxygen. Hyperventilation is different. With hyperventilation, you're going to get an increase in O2 and you're going to blow off a lot more CO2. So CO2 levels really fall. So changes in the rate of alveolar ventilation alter the concentration of gases in the alveolar air. Pretty good? Does that make sense? All right, so I just have down the road on these um, essential calculations.
So I'm going to go ahead and start with the gas laws. I don't think this will take too long. All right, so this is actually going to help you. I'm going to skip to the this slide right here and talk about partial pressure. Um, actually, I'm going to go back to this one right here. We, uh, on Wednesday, we're going to talk about um, how oxygen and these gases are uh, transported from the alveoli to the tissue. And in this particular slide, it's actually showing you the concentration of O2. What it does, it actually enters into the circulatory system. In the circulatory system at the lungs, you go from about 750 mils of oxygen, that's deoxygenated blood, to 1,000. That's transported to the tissue where you deliver about 250 mils of oxygen. Now, same idea with the uh, CO2. You actually produce CO2 just by oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, the pathway produces CO2 and it actually delivers. There's a driving force for the movement of CO2 into the circulatory system where it's eliminated from out of the lungs. It's eliminated out of your body by the lungs. Now the problem with this depicting it as concentration is that it doesn't show you driving force. So if you know how to calculate partial pressure of gases, you can actually see the driving forces, right? The partial pressure of oxygen in the air is 160. In the alveoli, it's 105. And in the circulatory system, it's 40 in deoxygenated blood. Now you can actually see that there's a driving force for the movement of oxygen into the capillaries, which then increases the partial pressure to 100. So first things first, how do you actually calculate partial pressures? Some of you might have had this already. This is called Dalton's Law of Partial Pressure. Dalton's Law. And the way to do this, it's pretty simple actually. The partial pressure, let's just say of oxygen, is equal to the atmospheric pressure, right? At sea level, that's going to be 760 millimeters of mercury, sea level. And then all you do is multiply it by the percentage of that gas within the mixture, within normal air. All right, so that's actually, uh, for oxygen, that's 21% or 0.21. That's going to give you the partial pressure of oxygen. Now, what happens if you go to Mount Everest? Why is it that people have to wear oxygen tanks, right? Is it because the percentage of oxygen is lower at the top of Mount Everest? It's actually not. At the top of Mount Everest, oxygen is still 21%. It's the atmospheric pressure that's so much lower. It goes from 760 at sea level to only about 260 at the top of Mount Everest. So that's why you're really struggling to get oxygen into your body. It's not because the percentage of oxygen has changed. It's because the atmospheric pressure has changed. So that's going to help you with some of your um, some of your your calculations. Um, I don't think I'm going to rush through some of these other ones. We'll talk about Henry's Law and Graham's Law at the beginning of uh, Wednesday's lecture and then we're going to talk about oxygen and carbon dioxide transport and then we're going to be done with the respiratory system. All right, everyone, have a wonderful Tuesday. And if you have any questions, just come on up. So uh, the exam's on track, which is good. Um, I'm just going to stop this recording. Oh, and then I put the one on the bottom. Yeah, so there you go. Yeah.